Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see all of you here tonight. I know we have several classes gathered in this room tonight because it's spring break and we have so many people traveling and that cuts down on our class attendance, but it's good to see all of you. And the good news is if you haven't been in this class for the past however long we've been discussing these things, you're not going to be lost. Uh, tonight's lesson can pretty well stand on its own, so hopefully it'll be beneficial to you. For those of you who have been in this class or who join us online each Wednesday night, we are finishing tonight our study of church history with the American Restoration Movement. And Lord willing, next week we will start the book of Hebrews. And so if you are uh, inclined to study ahead, we will uh, begin reading Hebrews and studying through it. And that study will take a long time. Um, I've mentioned that before to this class, but... You know, I like to have things scheduled and, and do them point by point, but the book of Hebrews is so rich, uh, first in Old Testament theology, but also in uh, the theology of Christ and Christology and uh, salvation theology and things of that nature, that it would be a disservice to just rush through it. So we're going to take our time with it, and I'm looking forward to that. hope you are too. Okay, let's uh, begin tonight by talking about the American Restoration Movement, also called the Stone Campbell Movement. This is particularly important to us because the very fact that we are in a building with the sign Church of Christ out front is a product, whether we want to admit it or not, of the American Restoration Movement. And I know, because most of us probably feel this way, and I do too, uh, that we say no, that we're called the Church of Christ because we are the original church and there's one church and you're either in it or you're not. It's the body of Christ and there you go. Okay, fair enough. But hopefully what you have seen if, you, is if you've been in this class over a period of time is that the church began in the first century and then over the 2nd and 3rd and 4th, all the way up to the 17th and 18th centuries, things changed. Things got away from the original practice of the New Testament. And so what I want us to look at tonight uh, are a couple of things, really. The first is I want us to look at the philosophy behind the Restoration Movement. What is it that they were trying to do and what is it that we're trying to do today by calling ourselves the Church of Christ? And then, uh, number two, I want us to look at two spearheads of this movement, Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell. Again, names and dates are frustrating for me as I know they are for you. But I would bet, if I was a betting man, that most of us in here, if you've grown up in the churches of Christ, you probably know the name Alexander Campbell and might be familiar with Barton W. Stone at least a little bit, and, and maybe that's the case. Okay, so let's begin by looking at the principles behind restoration. What is it that the restoration movement sought to do? Well, first, they wanted to return to Scripture. I have to admit to you, all of these I stole from a professor at Faulkner, uh, Dr. Todd Brenneman. He is uh, a genius when it comes to church history and restoration history. But and the, all of them starting with ours is very helpful for me too. Okay, return to Scripture. By the time we get to the restoration movement, regardless of whether the whether you're in the capital C Catholic tradition or the Protestant tradition, there are things that are taking place in that uh, Christian movement that don't fit with Scripture. And so one thing that we're going to see in particular with Barton W. Stone is churches were saying, if you want to preach, if you want to take this book and rightly divide the word of truth, you have to sign off on a creed. And so, for example, for Barton W. Stone, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but Barton Stone, to become a Presbyterian minister, had to sign off and confess to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, that has nothing to do with the text of Scripture. It's a man-made creed, and helpful as creeds are in some cases, I'm not necessarily denying that, but it is the fact that if it's not found in Scripture and is written by a man and is not inspired, it's not biblical in capital B, biblical sense. Do you see what I'm saying? And so Barton Stone had a problem with that, and um, several others did as well. And they thought, well, if we want to do church, if we want to do the church the way the Bible intends, 
we need to return to Scripture and see what Scripture says. And so, for example, what they find is there's no example in Scripture of baptizing babies. There's no example in Scripture of uh, taking of communion only once a quarter. Okay, That the patterns that we have in Scripture, the examples we have in Scripture, are different than what the churches were doing. So that's number one. Number two is we're going to repair what was broken or abused. Now, you might think at this point something along the lines of what we talked about with the Reformation movement and the selling of indulgences. In the Reformation movement of the 1500s, that movement got started primarily because the Catholic Church said, if you want your loved one to get out of purgatory and go to heaven, you need to buy this relic. Buy this nail that was nailed to Jesus in the cross. Buy this piece of thorn that was part of the crown of thorns. You know, and as soon as you buy that, your loved one will be sprung out. Well, that is obviously broken and abused in religion. And one thing that I find even today among our younger people, and one reason why they're turned off by religion, is because of that, that breaking and abuse of Scripture. And so the early restorationists looked at this and said, well, we need to repair what was broken or abused. Number three, we're going to recover the truth of the New Testament. And so I had a professor at Faulkner, and I've adopted this as my mantra, but I want to give him credit because it's where it came from, who said, I refuse to be a theologian. I'm not a theologian. I'm a biblist. And I think that's right. So I'll give you a quick example about this. We might talk a little bit later about this particular uh, instance with uh, the concerns of one spearhead in this movement. But, you know, the question for a lot of people for a long time has been, what role does the Holy Spirit play in the life of the believer? You know, we know Acts 2.38 that the, the promise, the gift that is given is the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes after baptism and repentance but how does the Holy Spirit indwell the person? Well, you can go in our library, you can go in my library and pick up book after book after book trying to explain how the Holy Spirit dwells in the person. Does the Holy Spirit dwell in the person through the Word? Does the Holy Spirit dwell in the person personally but non-miraculously? Does the Holy Spirit dwell in the person miraculously? Well, I, like my professor at Faulkner, decided I don't have to know how the Holy Spirit dwells in me. The Bible never actually says how the Holy Spirit dwells in me. All it says is that He does, and it tells me the result of what happens because He does. That's all I need to know. And so that's really the motive behind this recover the truth of the New Testament. What does the New Testament say? What does it say? And if we know what it says, how do we put it into practice? That's the how. Okay, how do we put it into practice? And then number four, renew the current state of affairs. So people like Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Isaac Eret, and others saw the current state of the church, quote unquote, that was in their area. And it, the, 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 the second, or excuse me, the restoration movement comes just shortly after and even during what is called the Second Great Awakening. Now, we talked about the First Great Awakening last week. The First Great Awakening was this strong movement of finding the gospel, of preaching the gospel, and thousands and thousands of people would come to hear these men preach the gospel, and many people were converted to Christianity through that, and it was a great time in American Christianity. Well, as time goes on, as is often the case, the zeal that started has now begun to dwindle. And now there's a time of a second great awakening where things are starting to look up, and that's what makes the preaching of Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone and others worth listening to. People are looking and they're hungry for uh, this information, for this true biblical teaching. But Stone and Campbell and... Scott and, and Eret and, and others viewed this not as a way to necessarily change anything, but as a way to promote true study of Scripture. And that from true study of Scripture comes the necessary change. 
So there are four things, re return, repair, recover, and renew. Now the question is, how are we going to do that? Okay, that's the big question. And so the idea of restoration that lay behind this is really twofold. Number one, there is an apostolic pattern. There's an apostolic pattern in Scripture that has to be followed. And so I teach uh, currently for Faulkner a class called Biblical Worldview 2. And what we do in that class is we talk about how to live in the world as a Christian. It's a gen ed class. Uh, I understand that 99.9% .9 of my students could not care less about that class. I was that way when I was a student at Freed Hardeman. Your gen ed classes you just don't care about. But this week has been really challenging because the material in that class covers worship. How do you worship according to the standard set in the New Testament? What's appropriate? What's not appropriate? And I would dare say about 85 to 90 percent of the students in that class, and it may be higher, are not members of the Lord's church, and a good percentage of them may not be Christians at all. Uh, these are people who are coming back to school for the most part. Uh, several of them are adults going back to school to finish a degree, and because it's at a Bible school, they have to take a Bible class. And, and so I get a lot of questions throughout the week about taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday or the use or not use of instrumental music. And my answer for them as your answer, I'm sure, would be, is based on that apostolic pattern in the New Testament. That the apostles had their teaching that they had to receive from somewhere, which I would argue was Jesus. And so through that apostolic authority and that apostolic teaching, we get the apostolic pattern. Now here's the question. If we're going to restore the original church of the New Testament, which church sets the apostolic pattern for us. Now that may sound like a ridiculous question because we know that there's one church. But to the early restorationists, it was not a ridiculous question and it was a question that they were met with quite a lot. Well, are you going to go with the apostolic authority to the church at Corinth? Or are you going to go with the apostolic authority to the church at Ephesus? Or the church at Galatia? Or the church at Thyatira? Which apostolic pattern are you going to follow? And the answer that the restorationists gave is the same answer that we would give, and that there is one church, and that all of those apostolic authorities blend together as coming from the Lord. Okay, so there's number one. There's an apostolic pattern that is intended to be followed even today. Number two, there was a gradual falling away over the centuries. Churches and Christians moved away from apostolic teaching in a negative way. So, we have we started this class looking at the church in the early 2nd century. So we've been roughly 2,000 years, give or take, in a history lesson in this class. We saw one Wednesday night, I gave a presentation on baptism in the early church. And so roughly contemporary with the book of Revelation, if you remember that lesson, roughly contemporary with the book of Revelation is a document called the Didache. And Didache just means teaching, and it's supposedly the teaching of the apostles. And the Didache talks about baptism, and it says, if you're going to baptize somebody, it needs to be in cold running water. Now, those of you who are in here will remember this, but... Next time you go in a small country congregation that has the mural painted on the back of the baptistry, that's why. Because it's running water. Now if you can't find cold running water, then it needs to be in warm running water. And if you can't find warm running water, then cold still water. And if you can't find cold still water, use warm still water. And if you can't find any of that, pour three times over the head. So by the time of Revelation, or shortly thereafter, around the turn of the century... We're seeing doctrines change from the New Testament practice. Well, the restorationists look at this and they look at the history of the Catholic Church and they look at the history of the Protestant movement and they say, this falling away didn't happen overnight. It was gradual. And as 
that gradual falling away took place, it took place in three ways. Number one, they added to Scripture. Number two, they omitted from Scripture. Or number three, they changed Scripture. So there is obviously a need for restoration here. Now, the question might be, because at this point, if you remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the Reformation movement of the 1500s, it seems like the same thing is happening here. You have uh, people, men who are looking at the text of Scripture, who see that it doesn't match with the patterns of the church and the practice of the church, and therefore things need to be changed. And so the Protestant movement has grown and is really rich in America at this time. And so the question might be, why are there restorationists who see a need even among Protestantism? Well, here's why. They believe that the Reformation movement still possessed too many Catholic elements. So think about this. You know, Martin Luther began what we know of today as the Lutheran movement. The Church of England was, is technically, as far as I'm concerned, a Protestant uh, movement, but the Church of England was only started because Henry VIII wanted a divorce and the Pope wouldn't give it. And so he starts his own church where he's the head of the church and makes the rules, right? So uh, you still have elements of those things at this time. You still have those, uh, <laughs> there's a lady up here at Sports Clips who cuts my hair on a regular basis. She's Episcopalian and she, she tells me that she's diet Catholic, I mean, those are her words, not mine, but I think that's a pretty good way of looking at it. And this is what uh, these restorationists were seeing with that, uh, with, with that Catholic flavor to the, the Protestant movement, even though the Protestant movement had left Catholicism to a great degree. So what is it that the restoration movement wants to do? First and foremost, they want to restore the original church of the New Testament. Okay, restore the original church of the New Testament. The theme of being undenominational comes from the restoration movement. Now, hear me on this. There's a difference between being non-denominational and undenominational. Now, you can go to several congregations in our local area that are non-denominational and I would dare say that their theology and practice would differ from what we would see in Scripture and what many of us would be comfortable with. But undenominational means not only are we not tied to a denomination, but there's no such thing as denominations. There is one church, you're either in it or you are not. Now, the question that's going to come up among the restorationists is, how do we know who's in and who's not? What's the criteria? We'll talk more about that when we get to uh, Alexander Campbell and the, the movement today as it is. Okay, so that's what they want to do. They want to restore the original church of the New Testament. And they want to do that by using no creeds, formulas, or human authorities. Now, I think we would all stand by this today. In fact, if you go in Ron's office, my office, or the church library, we have oodles and oodles of commentaries written by scholars and godly men that can help us understand the Bible better. But I would almost bet if I was a betting man that if I stood up here with a commentary and preached a sermon from a commentary, I would at the least have a meeting with the elders. Right? Because there's a difference between something that is written by man and something that is man-made, and something that's man's opinion, and Scripture. So here are the goals. We're not going to use creeds, and we're going to take the Bible alone. The problem with that, and you know, I find humor in humorless places, the funny thing and the problem with that is their desire to have no creeds forced them to have several creeds. One of which you're all familiar with, uh, no creed but the Bible alone. Right? You've heard that before, I'm sure. No creed but the Bible alone. Well, when you say that over and over again, it kind of becomes a creed. When you make that the defining feature of your doctrine and practice, that kind of becomes a creed. Uh, creed may be the wrong word. Mantra may be a better word, but still. Uh, here's another one that you're all familiar with. Speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible's silent. Okay, pretty good to put into practice, I think. 
And, and I, we, we promote that, you know, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. The question that I have and that you all probably have had, and I don't know that we can answer any of these issues tonight, what about things that we've done where the Bible doesn't speak and yet we have spoken? Prime example is our meeting tonight. I find nowhere in the New Testament where the early church met on a Wednesday night for a 45-minute Bible study. But here we are. In fact, the Wednesday night Bible study, so far as I can tell from what little research I've done, comes from the Quaker movement and the Puritan movement where they met on Wednesday nights for prayer. And then the prayer turned into Bible study. So there's a place where the Bible doesn't speak and yet we've deemed it necessary. So much so that those who don't attend on Wednesday nights, we often hold guilty of forsaking the assembly of the saints. Okay. But then we might use uh, the other side of the coin for this and say, well, the Bible gives no provision for the use of instrumental music in worship. Okay. So the Bible is silent on that issue. And therefore, the Bible's silent, therefore, I'm not going to speak because the Bible is silent. Now, I'm not saying that one's right or wrong or whatever. We can talk about these issues later at length if anybody wants to. But just, I'm using these as, a, as an example here that the mantra of speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent can and often does cause problems among interpreters of the text, who you all are, as I am. So, Think about that as we think about the creeds. The, the fact is, that what prompted these, these two particular mantras, let's say, is because at this time, you have the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Nicene Creed, and the Constantinople Creed that are really guiding the church. And that in order to become a member of that congregation, a member of that denomination, you have to adhere to one or all of those depending on what denomination that is. And the restorationists look at that and they say, no, I'm not going to put my faith in a creed. I want to put my faith in the text of Scripture. Okay, so there are a couple of problems with, with these goals that we've talked about. The call for no creeds becomes a creed in itself. Um, it is also the case that speaking where the Bible speaks risks taking passages out of context. So I'll give you one quick example here and then we need to move on. Uh, I had a student this past week submit a paper I make my students write a paper every other week about the material that we've discussed and she was asking in that paper whether or not you can dance as a form of worship I thought well that's interesting and so I, I responded to her and I said there are examples in the Old Testament where dancing is used as a form of worship David dances before the Ark of the Covenant when it's being brought into Jerusalem right? now God did not command him to dance and I don't know of anywhere, and y'all may correct me on this, I don't know of anywhere where God commands dancing as a form of worship. It just says that David did it. Now in the New Testament, there's no example at all and no command at all of dancing as a form of worship. And so my response to her was, since we are under the new covenant and since we are under the new law and dancing doesn't appear as a proper form of worship, I would encourage you to not use dancing as a form of worship. Okay. Well, there's an example of where speaking where the Bible speaks being used out of context if I was to say, well, the Bible gives an example here and speaks of David dancing, therefore it's appropriate for anyone to dance as a form of worship. Do you see what I'm saying here? If we're not careful, we can take scriptures out of context and use this slogan to make them mean whatever we want, to, we want them to mean. Here's another question. Where does being silent stop? Where does, uh, like Wednesday nights, you know, the Bible says nothing about Wednesday nights, but here we are. Okay, keep those in the back of your mind, and we might revisit them at the end. Two uh, spearheads of this movement that I want us to talk about, one key uh, moment in this movement. The first is Barton W. Stone. Uh, Barton W. Stone was born in 1772. He died in 1844. Stone had an interesting upbringing in uh, his early years. He, he was a Presbyterian minister, began his career as a Presbyterian minister, but his religious upbringing prior to that was kind of a pick-your-flavor. Uh, he grew up Methodist, he grew up uh, all different kinds, diverse religious upbringings. Methodist is the main one before he became Presbyterian. And uh, that was a product uh, 
of what we called the Second Great Awakening. Remember, the First Great Awakening, we had men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield who were preaching and they were drawing crowds of 20,000 to 50,000 people at a time and they were preaching the Word of God and people were being converted and then that's dwindled off and now you have this second great awakening where there are preachers who are standing on street corners preaching to thousands of people and people are actually listening. Now I know that there are people today who go on street corners and preach, and I'm not talking about the crazies, I mean real ministers, real people who who have studied the, the text of Scripture, who go on street corners and they preach. And so far as I can tell, that is one of the most ineffective methods of evangelism that is present today. I'm not saying that it's worthless, I'm just saying it's one of the most ineffective. Now think about what they're doing, going out and preaching to thousands of people. People are actually stopping, stopping and listening to this. Well, Barton W. Stone was one of these guys who began to, to listen to these preachers as a Presbyterian minister. And in, in order for him to become a Presbyterian minister, he, like all the other Presbyterian ministers, had to confess and, and agree to and sign off on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, at this time, as he's listening to all these preachers and as he's getting in the text of Scripture and he's reading it for himself, he thinks, I kind of have a problem with putting my faith and my trust and my allegiance not to Scripture but to a confession or to a creed. And so one of his mentors told him, because Barton Stone wanted to be a minister and he wanted to be a Presbyterian minister, so one of his mentors told him, well, when they get, get you up to do your ordination and they ask you, do you submit to the Westminster Confession of Faith? Just tell them, I do so far as I see it consistent with the Word of God. Now, if you all have ever done any study in the Stone Campbell movement, this phrase is one of the most famous. And Barton Stone stood up and they asked him that question and he said, I do as far as I see it consistent with the Word of God. Now, they didn't like that, but they still ordained him. So, as time goes on, in the year 1801, really at the time that this Second Great Awakening is ramping up and people are coming out in droves to hear preachers, Barton Stone looks at that and he says, you know what, I can do that. And so at this time he has moved to the, the Lexington area of Kentucky, Paris, Kentucky, and he's preaching at the Cane Ridge Church. And he opens the doors and begins this week-long revival meeting called the Cane Ridge Revival. Now, if you've not heard of the Cane Ridge Revival, I can't tell you a whole lot about it tonight because of time. But I would encourage you to go home, YouTube it, Google it, whatever. It is one of the single most interesting things to ever happen in church history, let alone in the history of our movement. So, Barton Stone begins preaching. People come out all over the place. We'll talk about the Cane Ridge Revival in just a minute. But because of the Cane Ridge Revival and because of Stone's lack of adherence to the Westminster Confession of Faith, he begins to realize, I don't need to be quote-unquote Presbyterian anymore. Now, a couple of other things that prompted him to start this revival meeting and to, uh, to teach Scripture as Scripture is, is that Stone realized that John Calvin's tulip theology, that, that theology of total depravity, unconditional election, um, all, all of those things, basically, especially the doctrine of total depravity, where every person is born in sin and you are born lost, and so, which Calvinists get around this somehow, I don't see how, but it would lead you to believe that if you have a stillborn child, the child is in hell. Okay? Because, everyone, because you're born into sin. Right? Now, Stone took issues with that, and uh, he, he thought that that went against Scripture. He also took issues with the matter of the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is a tricky thing. Partly, he took, he took uh, issue with the word Trinity, because the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. It ain't there. And you all uh, may be more familiar with this, that... We, we talk today about, well, how do you describe the Trinity? How do you describe the Godhead? People say, well, it's like an egg. You have one egg, but you have the shell, the white, and the yolk. 
Well, that's not exactly right because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are of the same essence, right? And those aren't of the same essence. Then people say, well, it's like, it's like water. It's like H2O. You have gas, liquid, and solid, but it's all the same essence. Okay, but you don't have gas, liquid, and solid at the same time. And all these three are, are the same. And so here's what Stone took, took issue with with that, and, and honestly, I take issue with it too. The New Testament does not ever tell us a definition of the Godhead. Ever. So Stone took issue with the Trinity in those particular ways, and that, of course, is going to make him an enemy of the Presbyterian Church. Okay, here's Cain Ridge Revival. The Cane Ridge Revival had about 20,000 people in attendance. You can go on Google and Google a picture of the Cane Ridge Church. Uh, from judging the pictures, I would guess it's about a third the size of this auditorium. And so they didn't have meeting inside. They had it outside in the yard. And so uh, 20,000 people, it lasted for a week in August of 1801. If you're going to have a revival meeting for a week, have it at the hottest time of the year, I always say. Now... This Cane Ridge Revival has received a little bit of pushback because of the charismatic nature of the people who attended. And the reality is we really don't know what Barton Stone's opinion of that was. All we can do is speculate. As a matter of fact, in two weeks I'll, I'll be going to Johnson City uh, to Milligan University to present papers at the Stone-Campbell Conference. And uh, there's a guy named Doug Foster who is one of, if not the foremost scholar on the Stone-Campbell movement, who was asked about what uh, Barton Stone thought about, the, about charismatic and you know, the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Doug Foster said, I have no idea, no one will ever know. He never really talked about it. So, what can we say about the Cane Ridge Revival? Well, the, the, uh, the Cane Ridge Revival, Barton Stone's out there preaching, and people are barking like dogs, they're foaming at the mouth, they're convulsing, they're falling on the ground. And people are, uh, you know, people are critical about that because, well, you're attributing something to the Holy Spirit there and how do we know that that was the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. And so far as we can tell, one of two things is the case. Either it's the case that Barton Stone actually did believe that that it was the miraculous charismatic power of the Holy Spirit, or he didn't care. I'm inclined to believe that Barton Stone did believe in some kind of miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. However, what we do know from his writings about the Cane Ridge Revival was that all he really cared about was that people were hearing the gospel. So, maybe that could be a lesson for us. That when we have those who may not align with our religious tradition visit our assembly. And in their religious tradition, it is appropriate to raise hands. And many of us may want to go to them and scold them for such an act. And while there may be a time and a place for teaching... And discussion, that ain't it. The important feature is that they're hearing the gospel. We got to build the foundation before we can build the walls and the roof. Well, that's what Barton Stone believed, and this was him building the foundation. And so, the Cane Ridge Revival causes Barton Stone to be kicked out of the Presbyterian Church. Presbyterian Church didn't like what he was preaching, partly because he was preaching what they would call Arminianism rather than Calvinism. Calvinism says that only the elect are going to heaven and you're either part of the elect or you're not. And God is sovereign and He knows everything. Therefore, He knows who's elect even before they're born. And if you're elect, there's nothing you can do to be unelect. And if you're not elect, there's nothing you can do to be elect. Arminianism, on the other hand, says every person is given a choice. You can choose God or you can reject God. And that's what uh, Stone was preaching, that you can choose to come to God. Okay, well, the Presbyterians had a problem with that. Now, Barton Stone and a group of other men in this movement form what they call the Springfield Presbytery. Uh, 
Uh, not to be confused with Presbyterian or anything like that. They just the Springfield Presbytery. And in this group, they write what is called the last will and testament of the Springfield Pre Presbytery on June 28, 1804. So three years after the Cane Ridge Revival. And what they say in this document, you can read it online if you want to. What they say in this document is, they call it the last will and testament because it's as if, that, it's, it's as if they've died. And so what they're saying is, we have died to this former body of denominationalism, of Presbyterianism, of Calvinism, and now we are going to live in the one true body of Jesus Christ. That's what they say, and they send that off to uh, the, the Presbyterian Church. And their goal was not to create some separatist movement, like we often view the church today. Their goal was to bring in all denominations and say, look, if we'll just go back to the Bible and let the Bible guide us, we'll be all right. Now, that leads us then to the second figurehead, and we'll move kind of rapidly through, through him, unfortunately. Alexander Campbell. Alexander Campbell was born to Thomas Campbell. That should say Northern Ireland, sorry. Uh, born in Northern Ireland to Thomas Campbell, and Thomas Campbell was a Presbyterian minister. Now, Thomas comes over to America and preaches for a while, and then Alexander uh, comes over with his family later. Thomas Campbell had actually left the Presbyterian church before Alexander even knew about it, and Alexander left the Presbyterian church. And then Alexander and Thomas meet up in America and realize they both left the Presbyterian church in search of the New Testament, and so that's just kind of an interesting thing that happens. He was educated by his father. His father was an intelligent man, Thomas was, and uh, educated by Thomas because they didn't have money to send him to school, though over time he does get the chance to go to the University of Glasgow, um, although he says that the education he received from his father was better than the university education that he received. I'll give you this one for free. Parents, you need to be teaching your children at home. Because the Lord knows what they're learning in schools today. Now, on his way to America, Alexander had a dream on the ship. And his dream was that the ship wrecked and that all of his family with him were dying and that it was a terrible storm and that uh, he was going to die. And so he wakes up from his dream in a panic and he prays to God, God, if you will save me and my family and let us make it to America safely, I'll become a minister. Well, sure enough, his dream comes true and the ship wrecks. But it was not nearly as bad as his dream suggested. They were able to make it to shore. And uh, Alexander was even able to visit the ship multiple times over the week to get stuff and everybody was fine. So it wasn't really that big of a deal. But he held his end of the bargain. He becomes a minister. And uh, as he does that, he, he again goes to the New Testament. He reads the New Testament. He has the ability to read the New Testament in its original languages, which not everyone needs to know Greek and Hebrew to go to heaven. But there, there's something to be said for going to the original languages and figuring out what the original languages have to say. He's actually, I'll skip down to the bottom here. He is the first in America to translate the New Testament from uh, its original language into English. No one in America had done that yet. So, he breaks from the Presbyterian church, not over the issue of creeds, but over the issue of communion. At the time, the Presbyterian church would make you come forward to, to receive communion, and before you could receive communion, they gave you a token, and you had to put the token in a basket that was a sign that you were part of the elect. And so if you weren't part of the elect, you couldn't take communion. Now, Alexander Campbell had a problem with this. You know, how do you know that they're part of the elect? So he breaks from the, uh, the Presbyterian church over that. He realizes from the pattern of the New Testament that communion is to be taken each Sunday. And he also realizes that baptism should be done to believers via immersion into water. Now, the funny thing about this is he does not come up with that on his own. He's having a Bible study one night with a couple, and they're studying the Scriptures, and they're working through it together. And the couple ask him, they say, Mr. Campbell, uh, we understand from the, from the practice and pattern of the New Testament that if we want to be saved, we have to be baptized. We were both baptized as babies, but we were not able to make that decision. It was forced upon us, and we had no faith as babies. And we see that believers are the ones who are baptized by immersion into water. And so would it be possible if we did that? And so Alexander Campbell does that, and he realizes, oh my goodness, I have not been baptized properly. He and his father then seek out 
two Baptist ministers. And the Baptist ministers baptized them into water for the forgiveness of their sins. So, that's a split from the denominational teachings that have been in place at that time. Uh, Alexander also preaches a sermon entitled The Sermon on the Law. And this gets him in pretty uh, hot water with the Presbyterian church because he basically in that sermon says what we've been saying all night, that the New Testament church must be based on the New Testament, meaning not on creeds or formulas or men or anything like that. It has to be based on the teaching of the New Testament. Now one thing here uh, before we move on to the last slide and we'll move through it very quickly is that Alexander Campbell wrote what is called the Christian Baptist. I'm pretty sure in our library we have copies of the Christian Baptist. Uh, don't think Baptist here is denominational. It Baptist in the form of one who baptizes. Okay? Uh, and, and so he writes these as a, a way to engage with the thought of his day. Let's talk about the Stone Campbell movement today. Uh, where we are with that and what is happening, and we'll wrap it up. The group that came out of the Stone Campbell movement or the Restoration movement, whichever term you want to use, um, that should say three groups. At the beginning, there were two groups. There were the Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ a cappella. And from, it, it goes back and forth, depending on who you read. It seems to me that from the Disciples of Christ split off the, uh, the Christian church slash Churches of Christ. Now, here's the deal. Most of us probably wouldn't give this a second thought if we were driving down the road and we saw signs that had these things written on them. But you notice here, churches of Christ, on, on point two, churches is lowercase. Churches of Christ, on point three, as parallel to the Christian church, church is, or churches is capitalized. And there's a debate when you build a new building. Are we going to capitalize the C in churches or are we going to lowercase the C in churches? So let me describe each of these. You all uh, being here, I'm sure, and if, nobody, if you don't, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. But we, we're probably familiar with what Churches of Christ a cappella believe. And there's even a split in that today between institutional and non-institutional Churches of Christ, unfortunately. Uh, Disciples of Christ have traditionally been the more liberal of the groups. Uh, even today, the disciples are welcoming of uh, female leadership. They are welcoming of LGBTQ, uh, you know, identities. In, insofar as you don't have to control or repent from those things. I mean, we would be welcoming of anyone who's struggling with any sin. But come as you are, but don't leave as you were, right? So they've been the more liberal, uh, use instrumental music. The Christian church, uh, I have several friends who are members of the Christian church. They use instrumental music. They believe in uh, that the Holy Spirit illuminates the Word and that you cannot understand the Word unless the Holy Spirit works to allow you to illuminate that, which I, I would differ with personally. Uh, again, they use instrumental music. Okay, so there's the, the three groups that came out from the Stone Campbell movement. And the questions that we're faced with today... And again, these are kind of headache questions that I wish we had more time to discuss, but we simply don't. Who really is a, a Christian? Who really is a Christian? Is being a Christian limited to those who have been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins via immersion into water? If that's the case, what do our worship practices have to say about that? Like the use of instrumental music or not? That's a big issue today. On what can we agree to disagree? So, for example, can we agree to disagree with our non-institutional friends about how, we, how the local congregation spends its money, i.e. giving to uh, children's homes? You know, what do we think about that? And then what about church government? In the disciples and the Christian church, they would uh, even refer to their preachers as pastors or the teaching elder, even though they do have a plurality of elders. So... Uh, again, some things that we might differ on, but the reality is, and I promise I'm done with this, the reality is the church will always need restored because the church is full of sinful people. And the good news for us is we have the restoration here if we'll just get in it and read it and study it. Okay, we'll be in Hebrews next week, Lord willing. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. And Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday.